Joining me now is Stephen Sund, who resigned from his post the day after the Capitol insurrection. He's out with a new book, Courage Under Fire, Under Siege and Outnumbered, 58 to 1 on January 6th. Stephen, it's so good to have you on the show. Looking forward to having others read your book. But let's start first with this question. Just how vulnerable does the Capitol building remain today? And what steps do you think need to be taken to fix any of those vulnerabilities? Well, I think the, the department's trying to take steps to fix some of the vulnerabilities as far as the equipment. You know, at the time, I'd been trying to get equipment. And money's always been a problem, but they've almost doubled the budget of what I had when I was there. So they have plenty of money to get the uh, the equipment they need. The big problem they still have down on the Capitol is the fact that the security apparatus is set up in a political fashion. So you have political oversight over a police department. And what I mean by that is you have a Capitol Police Board made up of three politically appointed people, one one from the House, one from the Senate, and believe it or not, one from the executive branch. The uh, architect of the Capitol was actually appointed by Donald Trump that oversee the police department and really put, uh, do a lot to control operations. But even more so, I've got four oversight committees that report to a specific um, uh, uh, parts of Congress, political positions in Congress. And anytime you have political oversight over a police department, it's a recipe for disaster. So my concern is you've got the oversight of the police department that's creating a major issue that continues to create vulnerabilities for the police department. I think physical security on the uh, Capitol, I think it's getting better, but that still has a number of uh, things to correct. Uh, the other things that need to be corrected is, you know, intelligence and the Department of Defense support for uh, police departments. You know, you go into painstaking detail in your book about what that day was like. Um, why was it so important for you to get that down on paper? Because there had to have been so much that was going through your mind when you first realized what was happening on January 6th, but then to kind of have that story evolve, like, what would you say to people that are going to sit down and read your book that you want them most to take away from why you, you decided to write it? Uh, originally, I did not plan on writing a book. Uh, I had sat down, I wrote a letter to Congress, an eight-page letter that outlined exactly what I thought were some of the issues with, with the security structure, intelligence, and the Department of Defense, uh, and it went nowhere. I fought to testify before the Senate. People don't realize that. When I testified last May uh, before the uh, Senate, uh, shortly after uh, Jan uh, January 6th, they didn't want me to testify. I had to fight to testify there. So my plan wasn't originally to write a, 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 a book. I ultimately started uh, documenting information, doing a little bit of research, and I wrote this book for the men and women that were out there, the men and women that fought to save the Capitol, defended every inch of that with their blood, sweat, and tears because the truth wasn't getting out, and they deserved to know what happened. They deserved to know how they were let down by certain government agencies that day. Let's talk about how they were let down, because that's a really important component of what the 1-6 Committee, for example, was looking into. You say that senior military leaders had a delayed response to the attack, and that actually prolonged the riot and the violence. So what should have been done differently that day? So what your viewers need to understand is when a police department is outnumbered, when I've used every resource, and, and people need to realize I called in 17 law enforcement agencies, 1,700 officers to assist the United States Capitol Police, and we're still overrun. The only, the only recourse I have, the backstop for when the police department are overrun and called 911 is the National Guard. They have a program. It's called the Defense Support for Civil Authorities. It has an emergency um, authority section in there that they should have immediately started deploying assets to, to assist me. And the terrible thing is they had fully outfitted. They had assets with their right, with their right equipment uh, not far from the Capitol, within a half mile to two miles of the Capitol, and they wouldn't deploy them up to assist me. I now know that the military brass had a real you know, General Milley and um, the Secretary of the Defense, Miller, both have had expressed serious, uh, significant concerns for violence at the Capitol on January 6th, and even talked about revoking permits that I issue on Capitol grounds. Yet they never told me about those issues, never talked to me about revoking those permits. What they did do is they restricted, they put out this, this memo, and it's available. You can look it up online. Your viewers can find it. Secretary Miller put out this memo that restricted his National Guard from carrying the very assets that he knew would be necessary if the Capitol came under attack, um, and then wouldn't deploy any resources to help me that were within two miles of the Capitol for three and a half hours. So what's your take then on that final report that came out from the 1-6 Committee, heavily focusing on Donald Trump, who you and I are in agreement, as are 
millions of others that he was the, the genesis of this event on 1-6. But how do you feel about the fact that the 1-6 report did not give what I thought enough kind of focus itself on the breakdown in the intelligence, the information that you claim was not given to you that would have helped you protect your men and women that were fighting against the insurrectionists on January 6th? That's a that's a failure of their responsibility to the United States Capitol Police. You know, they're part of the legislative branch. You'd at least think they'd be looking out for the United States Capitol Police and the men and women that sworn out to defend them, who defended them that day. But it gets even worse. The inspector general for DHS, even though they identified that there was issues that uh, intelligence should have been handled better, really gave DHS a pass. And even worse, and I address this clearly in my book, and, you know, it, when you go through it painstakingly, I put every fact in there. The Department of Defense Inspector General said the re response from the military was appropriate. That's absurd. When you look at the political landscape now, as we sit here today and have this conversation, you watch what's happening, for example, in the House of Representatives specifically. Do you think the social and political conditions that led to the insurrection two years ago today, do you think those conditions still exist and that there is the possibility of another insurrection? I, I will say this. I think we are a divided and fractured country, and people look to their political leaders to provide leadership, to provide guidance, and provide a really a sample of what civility our society should be mimicking. Um, our, our, our politicians really need to step up to the plate. They need to grow up and start acting like adults and set an example for people out there, regardless of what side they're on, because people are looking to them to lead. There are elected leaders. It's a government for the people, by the people. They need to act that way. Former United States Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sund, I thank you for joining us. Looking forward to having everyone read your book. And I appreciate you taking the time to give us some insight into what you think were the failures on that fateful day. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Katie.